Welcome back everybody to Seize, your favorite podcast dedicated to ocean entrepreneurs and startups. Today, Antonia and I are chatting with Pat Schendler, the founder of 12 Tides, a snack company powered by Kelp. Today's episode is sponsored by Azure Design, a web design service aiming to help impact-driven people and organizations amplify the good work they do. If you're looking for a new impactful website, check out the description of this episode for more information and get 5% off any package when you mention C's. Let's get into today's episode. All right, so welcome, Pat, uh, to Seize the Podcast. We're really excited and honored to have you on today. Both Marianne and myself have been following 12 Tides for a while. So we're really excited to have you on. Thank you for making the time to speak to us. So you are the co-founder of 12 Tides and Nekton Labs. You're also an o ocean entrepreneur with experience in commercial fishing, aquaculture, regenerative ocean farming, marine conservation, and ocean decarbonization. Really amazing. Um, so would love to get started by hearing a bit more about your background and what did you study? How did that, you know, how did this bring you to where you are today? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Um, that was a very kind uh, introduction. Um, but yeah, a little bit about my background. So I came from a background in big seafood, um, worked on all sorts of large scale commercial fishing and aquaculture operations around the world, um, everything from 100 meter factory trawlers up in Alaska to shrimp farms in Indonesia, fish processing factories over in Germany, scallop harvesting, uh, net pen fish farms, everything in between. So I saw a lot of the dark sides of the world of global seafood. Um, you know, we import about 90% of our seafood in the United States. Most of it goes through long and opaque supply chains and supply chains that don't incentivize the most environmentally positive practices um, throughout and at the primary producer level. So uh, the more you crack seafood, uh, the seafood hood open, the uglier it gets for the most part. And I wasn't incredibly inspired by what I saw there. So I wanted to help create a more positive relationship between our food system and the oceans. And that led me to, led me to start 12 Tides. Um, from all my time in seafood, I started to meet some people who were growing kelp on these sort of regenerative ocean farms. And I thought the idea that we can grow nutrient-dense food with zero inputs and have a net positive impact on surrounding marine ecosystems was very compelling and should be a much bigger part of the food system. Um, and ultimately can help replace a lot of the uh, legacy extractive sort of seafood industries that I was um, you know, very much part of. Um, so one of the things that I sort of recognized in the you know very early days of kelp farming, it's like seven or eight years ago now, was that there was no profitable end markets for our farmers. And so we launched 12 Tides to essentially create that. We work directly with farmers. We buy straight off the farm and um, we do all the processing, product manufacturing ourselves. And we've created a very high value end product um, in our chips, which allow us to pay you know, farmers profitable prices and um, grow the industry sort of sustainably in the, uh, in the United States. Fantastic. That's amazing and really interesting. And I think all the links there, you know, in terms to a, you know, more sustainable future, a more circular economy, that's really great to hear. Um, and so you touched on it in terms of your professional experience, but what are your sort of other personal connections to the ocean? Did you grow up by the sea? Has it has, you know, has the ocean sort of been part of your life for a long time? Yeah, so, um, I actually, I didn't grow up by uh, the ocean. I grew up uh, actually in Minnesota, um, but the conservation was pretty well woven throughout my family. My um, mom spent her entire career in conservation uh, through a number of different groups, but also the Nature Conservancy. Uh, my sister works for uh, the National Marine Fishery Service in NOAA um, and has done so for her whole career. Um, so got a little exposure to that, um, you know, by, by sort of osmosis. I also started scuba diving when I was like 13 and got certified, you know, at a pretty young age and was been lucky enough to sort of travel throughout the world in my you know, younger life and 
do hundreds of dives on six continents. And um, I think that, you know, becoming basically my favorite way to spend time underwater is what um, uh, kind of facilitated my sort of interest in getting more involved in the oceans and, and seafood. I'd love to know about why did you decide to dive into the entre entrepreneurship route? Like you said, mm -hmm. uh, your family has work in NGOs, in governmental job, you know, that's a route you could have take. Is there anybody that inspire you to start your own business? How did you told yourself, yeah, that seems like a great adventure for me? Yeah, I think there were sort of two things. I think there's like a little bit of like... Um entrepreneurialness in the family as well my dad's side of the family had their own sort of building company that they started when they were you know teenagers and um sort of grown and existed since then and um but also on top of that like i i spent all this time in the seafood industry and then um i knew what difference i wanted to make and then i sort of like went around the seafood industry and looked at everything that was going on in the world of kelp, but also in the world of seafood. And I just didn't really see anybody making the change that I thought was required, um, you know, both for seafood broadly, but also kind of within kelp. And so I, I never really envisioned myself, right? I wasn't like, I'm going to start a company It was more of like, I want to have, you know, this particular impact. And like, I think the only way I can do that is by starting my own company. So let's uh, dive in. I think that's amazing. I think that that's something that we often hear on this podcast as well as people sort of think, well, I've identified this problem. I think I might have a solution for it. I see no one else doing it. So I might as well sort of get started and sort of almost in, in a sense, fall into the entrepreneurship route as well, which is a very sort of, you know, a great way to start as well by sort of thinking, well, I might as well do it myself then because I see no one else around me doing it yet. Um, so that's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so would love to hear sort of a little bit more about 12 Tide. So you've obviously touched on it and what you guys are doing, but, and, you know, but what was the sort of moment, I guess, where you thought, okay, this is something that I really want to build. You know, did you have an idea of the product from the get go? Can you tell us a, bit, a little bit more about, I guess, the start and the journey that you've been on? Yeah. Um, so the start came from visiting a bunch of farmers around the, the U.S. and sort of, you know, understanding sort of the lack of end markets. Um, I kind of realized two things. It was like kelp farming is a pretty scientific process. I have no background in that. I'm probably not going to be very good at growing kelp. And also a lot of farmers have no end markets or no place to sell their crops um, at harvest season you know, to the extent that I heard of a lot of people just cutting things off and, you know, letting it float off into the ocean. Um, so I recognized the need to create, you know, profitable, you know, high value end markets, um, you know, food products, especially, you know, premium organic food products is a great um, way to do that. And uh, so we started to build out, I guess, all of our own infrastructure from, you know, the supply chain and partnerships with the farmers to the processing infrastructure to product manufacturing And um, uh, we have scaled all of that up sort of in step. And so uh, we started at the farmer's market scale in like 2019. Um, so we we're sourcing a very small amount of seaweed. We had really little, like, you know, processing manufacturing facility. And, um, you know, we had one little farmer's market stall. And uh, now we are, have a lot of different partnerships with farmers um, on both coasts of the U.S., And we have a big uh, manufacturing facility and a huge, you know, processing capability as well. And we're in about a thousand um, retail stores um, on the West Coast and we're going to be expanding to the nationwide in October. So it's been a, a fun journey, but, um, uh, you know, definitely an exciting one. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. And really hope to see you guys one day at my local supermarket in London. Um, Yeah. And, and so interesting. And I really love on what you, you know, I love what you touched on previously about, I think also what it sounds like, you know, empowering farmers as well. And, you know, sort of giving them, you know, sort of, yeah, giving back to the farmers as well. I think that that's such a, such an important piece. I know that I've come across it in my work as well, professionally. I, I think I, I read a fantastic article the other day that was, that was saying that actually farmers are often, are one of 
you know, a fantastic actual custodian of the natural world as well, which we often overlook and, and don't really realize. Um, and more on the product. So at the moment, you know, if we walk into a supermarket and, you know, what are we going to see on the shelf that's from 12 Tides? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, we have uh, chips, um, these pretty unique sort of crunchy puff chips that we um, created ourselves, uh, featured kelp as the number one ingredient. Um, and we've got five different flavors of those. Um, and yeah, we're found at about a thousand stores, mostly focused on the Western side of the US uh, at the moment. And really the idea behind the product, I guess, was to um, number one, create something that, um, you know, is truly unique and, and number one, like accomplishes our mission. And so everybody in the food manufacturing world told us to just sprinkle, like create a product that already exists and then sprinkle a little bit of kelp on at the end and like call it a kelp product. And like that just didn't really accomplish what we had set out to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, you know, that was sort of criteria number one. And then, you know, the next couple of pieces were how can we create something that um, provides people with a good introduction to eating kelp for the first time, um, which is critically important for any sort of like ingredient innovation. And that sort of unfolds itself into, you know, having something at a reasonable price point that a lot of people can access. And it's not a huge risk to try it, something that they can eat right out of the bag. Um, if you trust people to have to trust people to cook with it or pair it with something else and they have a bad first experience with kelp, then it's dead to them forever. And also have something that is, um, at least lastly is genuinely good in its own right. It can't just be good for a kelp product. It has to be like the best thing that you've had. Or you know, if you think about the grocery store, there's 40,000 different products in there. And anytime you go to the grocery store, you're probably buying like 40 products. So yeah. you have to be in like the top, like 0.1% of the favorite things in the store to like make it into a customer's uh, cart. So you can't just be, you know, good for kelp. You got to be good for, uh, um, you know, across the whole grocery store. Yeah, I think that's very well put. And was there yeah, also a piece right. there for you about education? You know, did you feel like you sort of had to get consumers on board in terms of what is kelp and that you can actually eat it and then it can actually taste good and it could be a really nice sort of fun snack? Was there was there an element of that on this journey of yours? Yeah, there's, there's a huge element of that. And I think um, that's where a lot of our um, sort of marketing kind of time and effort goes is this educational um, element and um, you know, one of the challenging things that, you know, we have is that, you know, as some a really like new innovator in the kelp space, like we're scaling up the, the farming landscape to an extent, um, by providing, you know, commitments to farmers and, um, you know, helping, you know, make sure we can grow the quantities we need, the processing infrastructure, our own product manufacturing, as well as like sort of the consumer demand and education. So doing kind of a lot of stuff there, um, on that consumer um, education and demand side, I think um, it's critically important to understand like how we can weave the benefits of kelp into like what people are really looking for, like in their everyday you know, lives. And also, so that's sort of like one thing, like people want fewer, you know, processed foods and want more, uh, you know, healthier replacements, things like corn, wheat, rice, potato, um, you know, it has to taste great. So like, how can we weave um, our product into all of those sort of needs? And then there's also the, how can we appeal to people's sort of emotional like, connection to the ocean? Cause I don't think very many people like think back to their time at the ocean and they're like, F that place, like hate, hate the ocean. Like, no, like nobody, nobody thinks that way. I think everybody sure. has like sort of connotation with the ocean and I think we try to like bring that back to our product and brand and be like, you know, if, if this holds like a special place in your heart, like here's a way that you can reflect that in your daily eating um, habits or purchase um, decisions. And uh, I th yeah, I think that's, you know, been a, a big part of our marketing um, sort of strategy and help bring people into the kelp story. 
Amazing. I think, yeah, well, you guys have certainly been busy. I think, you know, hands in lots of pots, but I think you're really, really important. And, you know, when we both looked at your website, Marianne and I, I think we both really loved the, the, you know, that community aspect and that education piece that you have on your website and you weave it through all of your social media and your marketing. And I I think that that's fantastic. And I think you've touched on it already, but, you know, do you want to add anything else to that? You know, how does community, community and ocean activism sort of fit into 12 Tides and why is it important to you guys? Yeah, it's part of something that we wanted to sort of weave into our mission is you know, utilizing our you know, community and our fan base as we build up our fan base just from people trying and liking and enjoying our product, um, giving them that opportunity to then go out and sort of take action. Um, if they're inspired by our product and like the you know, change that we have for the ocean, like what else can they do to... Um, you know, be involved in sort of ocean conservation and restoration. So we've got our partnership with Sea Trees that, that we've had since we sold our very first bag. And we highlight a lot of the great ocean restoration efforts that um, they lead and provide ways for people to get involved in that. Um, and so, yeah, we, I, you know, we want to provide as many opportunities as possible for um, people sort of within our community to um, get involved in ocean restoration, which is not always an easy thing to do. It's uh, yeah, it's not like uh, you know going to your local park or something or highway and like picking up trash. Like you know, doing urchin removal dives like in Southern California is like a lot of cost and regulatory and like certification requirements to doing that. But um, you know, so it's not always an easy thing to get involved in. But we like to provide avenues for people to support that kind of thing. No, I think that's fantastic. And I mean, it's it's definitely a challenge. You know, so many people don't, you know, don't live by a body of water or by a coastline. And even though I think, you know, most of us are all impacted by the ocean in so many ways, it's hard to, I think, sometimes find that, that you know, that link. But again, I think that it's fantastic that you guys have gone that one step further and, you know, really involving your community and saying what you can do. And I think that that really speaks to, you know, the success and the, and the community that you guys have created. So, yeah, massive congratulations. Um, I'd love to chat now a little bit more about kelp, so a bit of a deep dive, if you will, into what kelp is and regenerative food systems. So, you know, I guess for people who Mm -hmm. don't really know, what is kelp? Is it seaweed? You know, what is it? Why is it good for both people and the planet? So yeah, kelp is a uh, type of seaweed. Seaweed would be the macro term uh, that splits down into red, brown, and green seaweeds. Uh, Red seaweed would be like your sushi nori um, that you'd have grown in Asia. Kelp is a brown seaweed, so kind of a different family than what most people would think of as seaweed, Um, but grows naturally closer to the poles, mostly in cold water. It's why winter would be the farming season for for kelp. And um, why is it good for the ocean? So, you know, it's two sort of angles that we take at this at at 12 tides is like more kelp in the ocean is good. It's, you know, regenerative and you can either farm it and actively sort of put more kelp into the ocean and, and, um, you know, maybe create even low kelp forests on sort of an annual basis. And we can also restore kelp naturally. And that would be more of our nonprofit efforts with our partners over at sea trees. Um, but what does kelp do for the ocean? Um, Kelp grows extremely quickly, um, up to two feet a day for certain species. And in doing so, it absorbs an enormous amount of carbon and carbon dioxide from surface waters. And that influx of carbon from the atmosphere into the surface waters is in large part what causes acidification, which can be one of the greatest, which is one of the greatest risks to biodiversity on the planet, um, if not the greatest. Um, in addition to that, it has other sort of nutrient regulating properties. So a lot of times our coastal waters see influxes of nitrogen and phosphorus driven by terrestrial fertilizer runoff. So kelp can you know, fix a lot of that nutrient, uh, that nutrient influx and provide a, uh, higher wall water quality for marine life provides habitat and uh, other sort of coastal protection, um, benefits. And so there's a whole host of sort of positive ecological outcomes while also being basically a zero input crop. So it requires almost nothing to grow from a resource intensity and you know, carbon emission standpoint. It's about 
ninety percent fewer carbon emissions, you know, per pound than corn is grown in the U.S. So, pretty compelling. It's amazing. I mean, I've you know, I know that I'm sort of operating in my own echo chamber, but I've heard a lot about seaweed and specifically a lot about kelp in the past year. And you just sort of think it's amazing. It does so much. You know, it, it's good for humans. It's good for the planet. It's good for the planet on on you know on this sort of regenerative you know system where. It, you know, it's it's a nursery for animals. It, it helps absorb carbon dioxide. It's amazing, and I think I feel like the momentum is building. But why why do you think it's taken so, like such a long time for adoption? Almost. Well, um, on the farming side of the equation, um, it is uh, we're very new to the idea of farming kelp in the United States. You know, we've been growing things like corn and wheat for centuries and centuries and so there's been um, a lot of sort of knowledge accumulated over that period of time and kelp farming is still you know sort of pretty new um there's a lot of so it's not it's not a zero risk endeavor to start a kelp mm -hmm. farm because it, it's uh, uh it, you know there's well, still a lot of unknowns about uh about farming kelp but uh, from a regulatory standpoint, that's sort of another ordeal. Um, you know, farming is done on private land uh, in the United States, and there's no private land in the ocean. So there's a whole sort of, you know, regulatory uh, structure uh, and requirements that are needed for kelp farming that don't really exist for terrestrial agriculture um, to the same level. And... I think another big factor is just like the demand. Like there hasn't been, um, you know, if there were really lucrative like end markets and places to sell kelp after harvest, I think a lot more people would be getting into it. Um, but the demand, at least, to, and demand from profitable end markets just hasn't quite been there yet. And so um, that's something that we're, you know, hoping to solve at, at 12 Tides. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think thank you for your insights on that. I think that that's really helpful. And so, I, you know, we, we've touched on it during this this conversation, but so your vision at 12 Tides is to create a regenerative food system that heals ocean ecosystems. And I'm sort of conscious of that. We might not have explained to listeners, you know, what what is a regenerative food system? So could you touch on that a little bit more? Yeah, so regenerative to us is net positive for ecosystem um and for us the marine environments in which our you know kelp is being farmed so uh mo the vast majority of all food production i would say is largely extractive um, extractive and resource intensive um and would not have sort of a net positive impact on the surrounding you know ecosystem um, but our kelp very much does that and you know we're getting better at you know, measuring exactly what that ecological impact is, but um, there's been a lot of evidence so far to support the idea that this does have, you know, positive, you know, net positive impacts, factoring everything in on marine ecosystems in which um, we're operating, and uh, for all the, you know, the benefits that I mentioned previously around, uh, you know, certification and mitigation, biodiversity impacts, the marine life abundance impacts, um, you know, other sort of, you know, coastline protection, things like that. So, um, by, you know, lessening our dependence on some of the legacy food systems, um, like industrial row crop farming that, you know, certainly could not be considered, um, regenerative, uh, I think we can sort of change the paradigm to like having to balance like these negative impacts with like other positive impacts in the food system um, to just producing food in a way that is a net positive. Yeah, absolutely. It's so inspiring to hear. Um, yeah, it's just fantastic to hear what you guys are doing. And I think you're really, you know, helping pave the way in terms of, I think, uh, a global conscious shift that we also need as well in terms of how do we think about our food and the way we produce it and farm it. So yeah, thank you for sharing. So on this podcast, we talk about the ocean, but we also, you know, talk about entrepreneurship. And I think an important 
part of building a startup that I feel in the um, conservation blue economy world we don't talk a lot about is how do we go about funding? So I'd love to hear about your experience when you had your ideas. You know, you told us about uh, the steps you took about contacting suppliers and um, visiting farmers, but how do you go about funding your idea? Did you get some grant? Did you, you know, invested some personal money? If you're comfortable sharing, obviously, um, I know a lot of people are interested into knowing how they can uh, put their own idea that has a great impact for the world out there and how they can scale it. Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, we, Got started actually with a small grant from the Tomcat Center at Stanford um, when I was graduating there, um, Sustainability uh, Center, and um, that helped us get to like the little like farmers market scale. And you know from there we've really um, scaled with capital from friends and family and. Um, you know, I think other sort of angels that are believers in our our sort of mission. Um, but it's been almost entirely sort of individual um, investments at, at this point. That's awesome. That's that's amazing. I think there's I think so like many avenues that. Yeah, like relatively minimal sort of investment. Um, yeah. And so we got scaled up, you know, using some of our own cash flow from the business as well as um you know maybe some kind of small checks here or there but that's uh we're not really a venture funded um sort of endeavor thanks for sharing that that's interesting and i'd love to hear also about you know we're talking about investment uh building a team that will help you succeed i know you have a co-founder or potentially many co-founders. Can you tell us about how did you go about building your team uh, of, you know, founders and after how do you attract the right people to help you build your startup? Yeah, um, we, uh, so in starting 12 Tides, I came from kind of that background in seafood and you know, seafood industry uh, as a whole is not really well known for its branding and mar marketing prowess. And, um, so I knew that I was going to need sort of that, um, those chops to do exactly what we talked about is sort of tell a story, build a community, um, you know, bring people in to, to kelp. Um, and so I met my co-founder in the early days when we were at the farmer's market scale. Um, she was working for an organic fair trade chocolate brand at the time and, um, was interested in. And starting something new and um, help sort of build up this story around ocean conservation and regeneration. And uh, so that's how I met Lindsay and you know, she became kind of our, my co-founder and, and head of brand. Um, and, you know, on, on the Necton Lab side, I know we haven't really quite gotten into that yet, but, um, you know, the... Again, I think it was kind of like a strategy of sort of understanding like what I'm good at and like what role that I can play in, you know, the company and then, you know, identifying the things that you need that you're not going to be good at and, uh, you know, finding the right people who are you know, really good at that. that. That's something that I tell people all the time is like, just um, don't try to do everything yourself and don't, um, you know, try to learn everything and. You know, if there's something that you don't know how to do, there's probably somebody in the world that does know how to do that. So you should, yeah, you know, your job as like the founder and CEO is to find the people who really know, you know, what they're doing and like bring them into your mission and not to try to like learn how to do it yourself. That's really great advice. And I think as, you know, a founder, I think a lot of people when they start resources are limited. So they feel like they have to do everything those are really great advice about, you know, finding people that are going to complement um, your, your strength and your skill. Um, so you've touched briefly about Nankton Lab. I'd love to hear more about uh, that other company that you're running. Can you tell us about um, the lab? What are you doing there? What's the link between 12 Tides, if there's any? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Nankton Labs is uh, a newer venture. Uh, it's still less than, than a year old. 
Um, the goal with Nectin and something as I discovered as we were working with number one, you know, kelp farms, but also number two, a lot of other types of um, blue carbon or marine CDR projects, you know, through sea trees and our you know, nonprofit work at at um, 12 Tides was that the ability for us to measure the ecological outcomes of a lot of these you know, projects that are going on in the oceans is um, severely limited. And I think it constrains, you know, the resources that are provided to these types of projects and, um, you know, the extent that they're making up kind of the solution set in the global climate equation right now um, is limited by really our ability to, to measure and quantify those ecological impacts um, and then you know, tell the story around those those ecological impacts. And so started Nectin Labs to be basically an ocean uh, MRV system to quantify a lot of the carbon and other ecological outcomes of marine CDR and blue carbon projects. That's awesome. So are you partnering with other maybe private companies that would... Um love to invest in blue carbon, but they don't know where to start or how does it work mm -hmm. concretely? Yeah. So, uh, the first phase, um, of the business is providing additional, um, insights and verification around existing blue carbon projects to, um, you know, buyers of credits associated with those projects, um, basically to provide you know, more insights so that the buyers can communicate the results of their project that they're supporting to their sort of stakeholders and constituents to de-risk that project by providing another level of verification and sort of ongoing insights um, into the overall you know, carbon impacts. And then eventually, you know, after that, um, we'll get more involved in, um, you know, project siting, uh, validation, um, the actual verification process themselves with you know, things like the registry, but those are much sort of longer lead time processes. But by providing, I think, better um, insights into uh, a lot of these blue carbon projects, I think we can attract more capital into, um, you know, those style of projects or into new styles of marine CDR projects, which we're also working with, um, that are not you know, necessarily registered or not issuing carbon credits or maybe have their own little way of like quantifying their like carbon credits, um, giving sort of trust uh, and insight into those new project types to help accelerate those as a part of the global climate equation. Because the ocean is our most compelling opportunity um, from a carbon standpoint. Um, and small changes in the ocean's ability to absorb and sequester carbon can have massive impacts on the global carbon equation. But it's been largely overlooked because of the complexities of working in the ocean and quantifying uh, outcomes in the ocean. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And there's definitely a lot of opportunities on this side. So. You know, as a founder of two companies now, do you have any advice for people who would love to, who have an, who has an idea and would like to become an ocean entrepreneur? You know, beside um, maybe delegating some tasks to people who know how to do things better than yourself, do you have any other advice? Yeah, well, I would say delegating. I would say, you know, bringing people into your mission. Um, I don't like the word, uh, you know, delegating. I think it's more of a, um, it's a building kind a community of around you. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, this is what we want to do. And like, I'm really good at this part and you're really good at that part. And so, you know, yeah. we can make it all come together. Um, but yeah, I guess like in terms of advice, um, that I would have, it's, uh, you, you can always, you know, just get started. And, you know, even if you like work in somewhere else and you have another job, like, um, you know, just starting to like dive in and either carving out a certain amount of time for it, or even, you know, uh, formally like registering the company and like, you know, giving yourself that like 
okay, this is happening. It's real. Um, and, uh, I've seen a lot of people kind of like kick around ideas for like a long time and like not really just, you know, full commit. And so, uh, I think, you know, the more you can kind of put maybe a structure or set commitment or even like bring in a co-founder, like keep each other sort of accountable for like the progress that you want to make. Um, that's, uh, helpful ways to sort of get started and get things off the ground in the early days. And then obviously like find like quick and early, easy ways to like validate your idea. Um, so I think like having, uh, you know, if, if like step one is to like invest like $10 million into like this giant, like pilot plant for like something, something, and like, that's going to be a really hard thing to like get to that first milestone. So like, how can you get to like smaller milestone? Like for us at 12 tides is like, how do we come become like the most popular product at the farmer's market? And then like, after we got there, we'll think about like whole foods. So, uh, you can kind of break that down into, um, you know, more manageable little like first milestones. Those are really Those are useful advices. And I think, yeah, when you start with an idea, you know, you see very big and sometimes it's harder to come back and uh, see the step you can take to get there. And um, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so I'd love to know about the future for 12 tides do you have any new products coming on the market if you can tell us about that um is there any events around uh, the the business can you share um anything that are coming in the next year uh no i think the the only big thing that's coming is um we're going to do a nationwide launch uh with a major retailer in october so we've been mostly regionally distributed on the west coast to this point um, yeah. but we've got an opportunity to do a big nationwide launch. And so that will really, um, it's going to be a big moment for us. because it's like, you know, moving from, uh, along the trajectory I was just talking about of like farmer's market. And then like, then let's think about like one thing of whole foods. Now we've gone several steps down that. And now it's like, how do we become a national brand? And so now we're sort of knocking on the doorstep of that and, um, that will be a pretty exciting sort of moment. That's awesome. So what's the biggest goal for 12 tide? I'm sure being in every supermarket, you know, but beside that overall with the, the community around 12 tides, what's the biggest goal for the brand and the business? Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I would say the biggest goal for the brand and our North star is our overall, you know, net impact on the oceans. And so, um, you know, everything that we're doing from like building the community to selling products, like the reason we sell products is so that we can buy more kelp from our kelp farmers and like we um, create more like positive impact that way. So, you know, measuring that net impact is really what is um, sort of most important, um, you know, for us. And I think there's a lot of uh, different ways that we can you know, go about doing that. Um, both from the product standpoint, launching new products, new categories, new retailers, selling internationally, um, and doing that in all in a way that has positive impact on the kelp ecosystem and supply chain to growing our community and um, utilizing that community to you know, bring more people into the ocean restoration mission. Um, so I think, uh, you know, Kind of the combination of those two things um would be really where i hope to see 12 tides in the future is basically the leading brand in you know kelp and sort of defining kelp and you know ocean regeneration in the food system um as well as you know community of hundreds of millions of people that are um you know supporting ocean conservation and restoration projects and thinking about the ocean in their daily like lifestyle choices that's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for, you know, chatting with us today, for sharing your story. Uh, so honestly and openly, we really appreciate it. And uh, we hope people are going to go try 12 Tides, the kelp chips. 
Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much to our guests for being with us today, sharing their stories and the insight of being an entrepreneur. If you enjoyed this episode, as always, please leave us a review, a comment. We love to hear what you think about our conversation with these very inspiring people. If you want to follow us, you can follow us on Instagram at seas.co. If you're interested in contacting us, you can email us at hello at seas.co. This episode is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and you can watch it so you can see us converse and have amazing conversation with people all around the world. Thank you so much for being here and we will see you in the next one. Mm-hmm.